Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so today I'll be talking about when eating healthy isn't addressing orthorexia in the college population. Just to kind of give you a little bit of information about me, um, I um, attended um, part of a um, six-year medical school at University of Missouri, Kansas City, where I um, gained a lot of medical knowledge that um, I you know, didn't have a lot of room to kind of put to use once I switched into psychology. Um, I, I got my BA in psychology. Um, I, I finished my master's in counseling and guidance quickly thereafter and then decided to go on and get my PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. When I was in Lincoln, um, that's kind of where I found kind of the marriage of um, my medical knowledge with my um, psychology skills and knowledge um, and eating disorders were kind of the perfect place where you have to have a you have to have a background you don't have to have a background in both but you can certainly use both um, which kind of led me to the field of eating disorders um, after my PhD I um, taught in the counseling psychology program at UNL and I also served as a staff psychologist um, in the counseling center on campus where I also coordinated the uh, multidisciplinary eating disorders treatment team. In my role at Eating Recovery Center, um, I mostly assist colleges and universities in establishing eating disorders teams and protocols, um, helping to generate um, outreach tools and ideas, um, and conducting local and national trainings. Um, most recently, I've been working to develop innovative solutions for college campuses, um, and we've created the virtual intensive outpatient program um, that we now have available um, in California, Texas, and Nebraska. In today's presentation, um, I want to make sure that participants walk away with an ability to describe orthorexia and understand who is most at risk on campus to develop orthorexia. Uh, we'll also talk about assessing for orthorexia and treating orthorexia briefly. Um, and then we'll talk about developing outreach um, to assist students who may be struggling with orthorexia and other eating disorders. In order to um, meet those objectives, I'll be talking about um, a few relevant statistics about eating disorders in general on campus and the development of eating disorders. We'll talk about what is orthorexia who is orthorexia impacting on campus, what are some warning signs to watch out for, how to treat orthorexia, and then some outreach ideas um, for students who may be struggling with orthorexia. So first of all, um, why is this important to discuss on campus? Um, you know, by the time most campuses have, most students have gotten to campus, they've been either shamed or praised for their eating disorder. Um, which oftentimes leads into orthorexia-type behaviors where individuals become obsessed with health. Um, we also know that eating disorders do not occur in isolation and that treatment is more difficult, therefore requiring multidisciplinary teams and early intervention um, being a key factor to save lives. So I wanted to go back when we talk about orthorexia and kind of talk about eating disorders at an early age and kind of the beginnings of eating disorders. So we can talk about this kind of holistically um, and how this may play into the development of orthorexia. So we know that body dissatisfaction for eating disorders in general is the best known contributor to eating disorders. And this is certainly an area that impacts boys and girls. We know that by age six, girls especially start to address, um, express concerns about their weight. 40 to 60% of elementary school girls between the ages of six and 12 are concerned about becoming too fat. We also know that dieting behaviors, which serve as a gateway behavior to eating disorders, occur early. So 46 percent of 9 to 11 year olds are sometime, reported being sometimes or very often on diet. And of those, 82 percent of their families were also sometimes or very often on diet. 
So it's a behavior, a learned behavior from families oftentimes. And 35 to 57% of adolescent girls um, acknowledge engaging in crash dieting, fasting, self-induced vomiting, diet pill use, and laxative use. So we know that girls who diet frequently are 12 times as likely to binge as girls who don't diet. So we certainly see an early onset to the beginnings of some eating disorder um, behaviors. So let's talk briefly about how those then translate to campus prevalence. Um, so what we see, the most recent um, uh, Association of University and College Counseling Center Director survey um, in 2016 found that 7% of college students presenting to the Counseling Center identified an eating disorder as their primary reason for seeking care. This is an incredibly high number. 7% and first may not look that high, but when you consider the fact that no eating disorder occurs in isolation, most of these individuals are identifying anxiety or um, depression, substance abuse, PTSD as their primary reason. But in 7%, um, they are identifying eating disorder as the primary reason. We've also seen um, uh, a pretty consistent number that about one in five, one in four in some studies um, responded that they suspect that they have an eating disorder, that they've suffered from an eating disorder at some point in their life. Um, we also see that dieting trend continues. So about 91% of women surveyed on a college campus have attempted to control their weight through dieting. 22% acknowledge dieting often or always. Um, so if we did some longitudinal studies, then we would probably see those same individuals at age nine um, or 10 who are continuing on that trend. In a survey of about um, 185 female students, they found that 58% felt the pressure to be a certain weight and of the 83% that dieted for weight loss, 44% were of normal weight. We also know that um, uh, transgender and cisgender sexual minority college students have elevated rates of self-reported eating disorder diagnoses. And continuing, we see that Minority women who meet criteria for eating disorder diagnoses are less likely to seek treatment. Um, so we'll talk about specifically reaching out um, to minority women and to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and we also know that when we have those multidisciplinary campus-based teams, individuals stay in treatment longer and leave with planned terminations. So let's talk about the importance of early intervention for a minute. So college for many students is also, you know, is the point of early intervention. Obviously, if somebody develops their eating disorder earlier, we're hoping that they're getting treatment earlier. But what we know about eating disorders is that there's a mean duration of about seven years um, from illness to recovery. And of those, um, about 50% completely recover, so complete recovery is certainly possible. About 30% partially recover, and about 20% remain severely ill. We know that risk factors for death um, include older age at first presentation. So if individuals are not being recognized at early age, um, then that increases their risk factor for death. Um, lower weight at first presentation and the duration of illness, um, as well as others. But as you can see for those, it, it provides the, the case, certainly, that we need to be identifying eating disorders in our students and getting them treatment earlier rather than later. OK, so orthorexia nervosa. Let's kind of get down into the nitty gritty of orthorexia. So what we know about orthorexia is that this is an unhealthy obsession with otherwise healthy eating. The term orthorexia nervosa was coined in 97 by Dr. Stephen Bratman to describe an obsession with proper nutrition. Um, on the surface, orthorexia appears to be motivated by health. 
Um, and individuals with orthorexia certainly maintain that this is motivated by health. But what we find is that healthy eating in orthorexia oftentimes goes too far to the point of restriction, um, and we can see the same effects on the body that we see with anorexia. So with orthorexia, um, uh, the problem exists. So individuals can be health conscious, can, um, you know, there's a point at which health is not a bad thing, and then health, you know, the, the drive for healthiness taken too far, which is what we see in orthorexia, becomes a problem when it becomes overly restricted, um, and, and we see that individuals are avoiding, eliminating entire food groups that are perceived to be unhealthy or bad. Um, and then we see physical, social, and emotional well-being and overall quality of life being impacted. So you see this photo on the screen um, that may represent the thought process of somebody with orthorexia, you know, of, of considering a, a stalk of celery and looking at, you know, is it healthy? Um, what are the calories from fat? What's the sodium content? How many sugars are in this? Um, and, and kind of deciding yes or no, is this healthy enough for me to eat? Um, and you see the maybe, which um, most of us could agree that a stalk of celery is probably uh, pretty okay food to eat, um, as with the rest of foods. Um, but, but this thought process of kind of um, being caught up on every little detail to make sure that it's healthy, we oftentimes observe in individuals with orthorexia. So when we talk about orthorexia, it's important to discuss that orthorexia is not yet a diagnosable disease. Um, so it's not currently in the DSM-5. We anticipate that it will show up in the DSM-5.1, um, but we're not sure where. Um, so when we talk about orthorexia, it has many criteria that fit in the eating disorder category, but it also has many criteria that make it a better fit in some ways um, in the OCD category. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this ends up. These are the proposed diagnostic criteria that, as you can see, if you're familiar with the DSM-5, are set up very similar. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through these, um, and then we'll continue kind of talking. Um, so similar to um, the DSM-5, um, we see the proposed criteria um, kind of broken down into um, criterion A. And what we see for criterion A um, is that this is kind of a narrative description of the condition. So it's designed to capture the fundamental characteristics of orthorexia. Um, and so when we talk about that, we see obsessive focus on healthy eating as defined by a dietary theory or set of beliefs whose specific details may vary, marked by exaggerated emotional distress in relationship to food choices perceived as unhealthy. Uh, weight loss may ensue as a result of dietary choices, but is not the primary goal. So this is where it doesn't fit perfectly with eating disorders because Weight loss may ensue, but it's certainly not the primary goal. And so what we see, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, is that oftentimes orthorexia can turn into anorexia when this weight loss um, occurs if then there is a drive for thinness associated with that to continue losing weight, then we see it no longer fitting the criteria for orthorexia and shifting into meeting anorexia. Um, diagnostic criteria. So kind of going along with criterion A, we see compulsive behavior and or mental preoccupation regarding affirmation and restrictive dietary practices believed um, to promote optimum health. Um, a violation of those dietary rules causes exaggerated fear of disease, sense of personal impurity, negative physical sensations, um, and of course accompanied by anxiety and shame. And then dietary restrictions 
tend to escalate over time and may come to include elimination of entire food groups and involve progressive, more frequent, or severe cleanses um, that are regarded as purifying or detoxifying. And so this escalation often leads to weight loss. Um, but again, that desire to lose weight is absent, hidden, um, or um, in subordination to the idea of healthy eating. So we see focus on healthy eating. Um, we see emotional distress. Um, the food choices perceived as unhealthy. We see that weight loss may result, um, but is not the primary goal. And we see shame and guilt, um, or anxiety and shame, uh, coming from um, those self-imposed dietary rules. <clears throat> so when we go to criterion B, we see that um, we see the impacts here. So the compulsive behavior and mental pre preoccupation becomes clinically impairing um, by any of the following. So one, malnutrition. So as we said, um, an orthorexia can be very similar to, or to anorexia um, in, in the impact of malnutrition. Um, so we can see severe weight loss, other medical complications, and the same medical complications from malnutrition that we see in anorexia. It can also be interpersonal distress or impairment of social, academic, or vocational fun functioning secondary to the beliefs and behaviors about healthy diet. So you can see this certainly um, in no longer being able to have meals out at restaurants, no longer being able to have meals with friends, um, maybe not being able to eat at work because of different circumstances. And oftentimes what we see is that orthorexia becomes more and more um, limited. So we may see somebody who starts with um, being gluten-free, and then they include dairy-free, and then they become uh, vegan, and then they become um, clean, um, and then they will only eat food developed or prepared for them in their garden and washed by their own hands. And so this is just an example of how um, one, one you know, decision kind of morphs and takes over. And when you consider how much our society has to say about what's healthy and what's not, um, for somebody in this mindset, it really is um, a tangled web because there's, there's advice and there's answers everywhere that you look. Um, another impairment we see is with positive body image, self-worth or identity, um, satisfaction being excessively dependent on the compliance with the self-defined healthy behavior. Um, so, so their entire self-worth, body image, or identity is um, connected with their compliance for uh, their healthy behaviors. So to kind of talk about the statistics a little bit, so where are we seeing this? How often are we seeing this? What are we seeing in regards to orthorexia? I will say there continues to be limited research on orthorexia, mostly because it's not yet a diagnostic category. And so once it becomes a diagnostic category, we expect um, this area of research to blossom um, and, and have much more um, depth in our research that we have available to us. So the fear of the freshman 15 um, can certainly be a component of this. So in a, in a systemic, systematic review of health research and, and popular literature, what we found is that half depicted a freshman weight gain of 15 pounds, despite research indicating only a five pound weight gain. And that five pound weight gain being um, um, normal for the development of everybody at that age range. Um, so there, there can be this fear of the freshman 15 that can incite this desire for healthy eating um, or for health. Um, and then even though there's not a desire to lose weight, there may be a fear of gaining weight 
um, to become more healthy, then that can kind of take over. And that mindset that we talked about going from, you know, paleo to clean to raw, et cetera, et cetera. What we also see is that um, there was a small end study, so they, they examined 327 college students from a convenient sample who just happened to be psychology and dietetics majors and found that over 68% of female students and over 43% of male students met criteria for orthorexia. So, so certainly high percentages. Um, excuse me, the researchers did note that um, this may be um, based on their career choices. It may, there may be a connection, but we need further research to tease that out. Um, so, so to talk kind of more about this connection between orthorexia and anorexia. So they certainly share a lot of common traits. So we, share, we see shared traits of perfectionism, high traits of anxiety, high need to exert control, um, in addition to the potential for significant weight loss. Um, we also see a lack of insight into the condition um, and denial of um, consequent functional impairments with both anorexia and orthorexia. When we look at orthorexia and OCD or OCPD, we see that they share traits of perfectionism, rigid thinking, and preoccupation with details and perceived goals. So there's a lot of overlap with both anorexia as well as OCD, OCPD. So it will be interesting to kind of see um, when the next DSM 5.1 or DSM 6, uh, whatever they call it, comes out um, to see where this may lie. So, so the question, I kind of skipped ahead to this, but is orthorexia an eating disorder? So again, orthorexia is not an official eating disorder diagnosis. Um, it is an emerging pattern of disordered eating as a form of coping um, that is commonly reported by professionals. So, so we've seen this in the field for a long time, um, and professionals have been reporting this. So, so once we started kind of once the phrase orthorexia came around, many professionals in the field said, ah, that's what I'm seeing. Um, <clears throat> so what we see is that the obsession around eating healthy spirals or can spiral into a diagnosable eating disorder. Um, and then those restrictive and compulsive eating habits um, may be, again, that question is, is this a new eating disorder? Um, or is this a variant of an existing eating disorder? Um, <clears throat> or does this fit in with OCD? Um, so it, <clears throat> excuse me, the answer is certainly yes um, to all of those. Uh, we see traits of eating disorders, we see traits of OCD, um, and it certainly fits well with both. And I think this phrase here, when passion turns into an eating disorder, um, is a pretty clear um, and pretty good description of the experience that we hear patients talk about. So in terms of the development of orthorexia, we see that um, similar to eating disorders, orthorexia is a method of coping to manage emotions, can be an illusion of control. Um, it can help with, um, it can be a factor of self-esteem, trying to improve self-esteem. Um, it can also be a factor of identity. We also see um, the obsession with health, certainly being a component of the development of orthorexia. Um, the obsession with weight and appearance we see as a common factor in the development Obsession with exercise. Um, so typically when we see this in individuals, um, the idea of, of finding this healthy diet typically also includes the idea of finding the perfect exercise routine. And so this person may shift exercise routines and forms of exercise as frequently as they shift diets. And then with individuals with orthorexia, we see that 
Eating, eating is no longer a choice. It becomes an identity, a fixation, or an obsession. And what we see with orthorexia, similar to what we saw with anorexia, um, is that there are many pro-orthorexia websites. Um, there's a field of people um, who are proud to have this diagnosis, um, who shares tips with other individuals with orthorexia. And so unfortunately, we see that um, same, uh, you know, same occurrence that we've seen um, with anorexia in social media and environments where individuals are sharing tips of becoming better at their orthorexia. Okay, so warning signs. What can you be aware of on campus or what can you be looking for in students to identify who may be at risk for developing orthorexia? Um, so obsession with maintaining the perfect diet. So it could be really important to ask questions about this, um, about um, are you um, pursuing identifying the perfect diet? Um, do you change diet patterns frequently um, to try to improve health? Um, obsession with food cleanliness and purity, we see this oftentimes going along with orthorexia. So as I mentioned, these individuals in, in advanced stages can oftentimes um, be really concerned and obsessed with cleanliness and purity to the extent that they will only eat um, food that's grown out of their own garden and cleaned with their own hands, that they no longer trust even raw food um, that's been washed by someone else. Another thing that you may observe on campus is restricting due to unconfirmed allergies. Um, so as I worked with many of you, I, that's one of the things that many of you have put in place that has identified students with eating disorders, um, is having um, somebody examine individuals who are reporting allergies to the dining hall. So if somebody comes in, a student comes in and says, I'm vegan, um, I have uh, celiac, um, and I have a dairy allergy, it would likely be, be worth time to have that individual meet with a dietitian who's informed on eating disorders or meet with the eating disorders treatment team to determine if those are true allergies um, or if that is part of orthorexia or of another eating disorder. Um, so rigidity around food preparation is another one. Elimination of foods in entire food groups. So if you have a client saying that they're vegan, uh, gluten-free, um, dairy-free, non-GMO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, orthorexia may certainly be something to consider. Um, significant or rapid weight loss. Um, as you may surmise that when diet gets so restrictive, um, there's oftentimes going to be rapid weight loss along with that. Um, so if you're only eating carrots, <laughs> it's hard to eat enough carrots to actually get your nutritional needs met, um, to get the calories that your body needs, and so oftentimes we're going to see rapid weight loss with that, um, which is certainly a sign of malnutrition and medical complications. Um, we see excessive or obsessive use of supplements oftentimes with these individuals. Um, so their main source of um, food intake may be from protein supplements. Um, we see obsession with exercise, anxiety about eating, increased exercise or eating vigilance to atone for, to atone for slip up. So um, individuals with orthorexia may no longer uh, go to social events um, because of food there. However, it may also be that if they go to food events, um, then they are um, increasing exercise, uh, they're eating more vigilantly to make up for those slip-up days. We also see obsession about links between food and related health concerns. And again, um, if you're paying attention to the media, it's telling us something about the connection or the link between foods and health concerns daily. So if this is an obsession for you, um, then you can see how, how challenging that would be when we're getting constant societal messages about 
how different foods may be linked with health concerns. We also see withdrawal from professional, educational, social, and familial activities um, to adhere to rigid diet exercise rituals. So individuals with orthorexia may not attend weddings, they may not attend birthdays, they may not attend holiday events um, because it's easier to skip than it is to um, you know, let others see their diet and exercise rituals. So how do we assess for orthorexia? Um, so these are some great questions um, that Stephen Brotman and other researchers developed um, to ask about orthorexia. They're um, simple, brief questions that can be added to any intake um, interview as well as any intake paperwork. So do you obsess over the quality or purity of foods you consume? Do you avoid restaurants? family gatherings, and other settings where you cannot eat healthy or clean? Does the thought of eating normal food make you anxious or upset? Does your ability to adhere to strict eating regimen uh, define your worth? So those are some pretty key questions to tease out orthorexia. So if you suspect, you know, if you hear that somebody is um, engaging in these ritualistic um, diets, health, um, then these would be key questions to pull out of your toolbox. Um, so asking if they obsess over the quality or purity of foods, do you avoid restaurants, family gatherings, or other settings where you cannot eat healthy? Does the thought of eating normal food make you anxious or upset? Or does your ability to adhere to your strict eating regimen define your worth? So we may see with that last one that individuals with binge eating may also um, identify with that question. Um, with the others, um, we're mostly only going to see individuals with orthorexia um, and sometimes with um, anorexia acknowledge or endorse um, answers to those questions. So challenges for those with orthorexia, as I've alluded to, um, challenges are everywhere. So this is just um, a little glimpse um, it may be challenging to see, but I searched how to eat healthy in Google, and I got eight, about 8 million results. Um, so if the obsession is eating healthy, then you can see that there's so much contradictory, conflicting information that um, this can be overwhelming to anybody, and certainly um, if your worth, if your value is wrapped around the ability to eat healthy, um, quote unquote healthy, um, then then these this wealth of um, social media, media, um, internet um, information that's available um, can certainly complicate and and create more challenges um, to individuals with orthorexia. So you can see Health Magazine, Eat Clean Now. Um, with a world-renowned chef on the cover, it's kind of a confusing message. <laughs> um, clean Eating Magazine with um, gluten-free meals. Um, so again, now you're clean, now you can be also gluten-free. And then Clean Eating with Superfoods for Super Health. Um, Dr. Oz, Eat Clean the Oz Way. Um, vitamins Your Skin Really Needs. You know, just... Um, lots of challenges, lots of different message, messages that individuals are getting. So how to treat orthorexia on campus. So you're going to treat orthorexia very similar to the way you treat other eating disorders. Um, it's important to involve dietitians when possible. I know that many of you don't have dietitians on campus, and so if you don't, Try to develop relationships with dietitians in the community so that you have ready-to-go referrals for individuals who may be struggling and who need kind of that warm handoff to a dietitian. Um, if you need help with that, reach out to us, and we're more than happy to help you identify dietitians in your area um, who are good with treating eating disorders. So it's treated similar to anorexia. The goal would be to... Um, increased food intake to incorporate more nutrition, 
Um, as a psychologist, I don't want to do this in my office, and I'm guessing the rest of the therapists don't want to do this either. Um, so this is certainly where um, there is a strong, strong need for a referral to a dietitian. Um, working on underlying issues such as body dissatisfaction or schemas and, and maintaining factors of the eating disorder or orthorexic behaviors. Medical stability, um, so a referral to a medical provider um, is also incredibly important to make sure that there are no um, impacts or effects of, of malnutrition. Um, um, and I would word it that way. So I think one of, the, one of the careful ways of making referrals to medical providers is that sometimes as therapists and dietitians, um, we can kind of be overly alarming to our patients. And so we can say, like, let's make sure everything is okay or, you know, this might be off. And so when patients go and they get normal lab work, then they think, whew, okay, I'm good, we're good. So I think it's important to set up that, you know, we want to get baseline numbers. We want to make sure that they're okay now and stop the progression from those labs becoming bad um, so that they, when they hear that labs are normal, which they're likely to be, um, there's not going to be this um, belief that, okay, they're fine, the behaviors they're doing aren't dangerous because of that. Uh, and then a possible level to a possible referral to a higher level of care. Um, so orthorexia, as we talked about it, can be incredibly obsessive, um, and it can be really challenging if somebody um, doesn't have a strong desire to change to do that work. Um, certainly, the initial work on an outpatient level. So, so you may need to refer somebody to a higher level of care so that they can have support and help in incorporating new food groups. Um, and developing um, different patterns of eating and exercising. Um, so in, in terms of treatment, the incorporation of values, DBT, um, and exposure and response prevention can be incredibly important. So with ACT um, or ACT, we see that values are incredibly important. Um, I will say I'm biased in this area. Um, I taught theories um, and graduate counseling psychology programs, um, and I've also utilized um, a variety, variety of theories with patients. And in particular with college students, what I found is that college students are already trying to identify their values. They may not know it, but they oftentimes are. Um, and when we're asking individuals to give up eating disorders or the primary method of coping with um, challenges in life, then we need to have ways of um, helping them to understand why that's important. And aligning with their values um, is really the easiest, most effective way of doing that that I've found. Um, I've also found that for a variety um, of presenting concerns um, and diagnoses that values work provides a lot of aha moments in therapy. Um, so, so this can be, and I think this is a really important factor, particularly when we look at orthorexia, because it, it appears to the individual that their values are all related to health. And when you break down the values with tools like the Value Living Questionnaire, um, you'll find that it's not. You know, their values are not health. Their values may be uh, being a productive family member and part of their distorted thinking along with the orthorexia is that if they don't have the perfect diet, they're going to die of cancer and they won't be here to be um, a supportive family member. So, so values work is incredibly important for individuals with orthorexia. Um, mindfulness is also incredibly important um, because once you're asking somebody to um, give up this restrictive pattern a food intake and exercise, um, they, they need ways of being able to be in the moment to experience and to move forward. And mindfulness is really the best tool at being able to um, be in the moment, experience your thoughts and feelings, um, and be able to move forward. Distress tolerance can also be incredibly helpful with that. And in addition, um, for orthorexia in particular, 
um, food exposures are a pretty integral component of the treatment plan. Um, because the diet is so restrictive, um, they need to be able to incorporate new food groups um, into their diet once again. So when may somebody with orthorexia need a higher level of care? This is going to be incredibly similar to other eating disorders. Um, so if their body weight, um, excuse me, their ideal body weight is less than 80%, if they have significant suicidality, if there is medical instability or malnutrition, um, if they struggle with motivation to recover, they're likely going to need more support to give up um, the restrictive pattern of food and, and exercise. Um, if there are significant comorbid concerns, including substance abuse or um, other factors that, that need to be integrated into treatment. Um, if they need more structure to assist with weight restoration or behavior cessation, um, if they can't manage their compulsive overexercising. And by the time that this gets intense, it's really um, challenging to uh, manage on an outpatient basis. Um, oftentimes, um, both the individuals, you know, running in bed, or trying to run in bed and things like that um, in treatment. So, so having them in a um, treatment facility may be the best um, initially to manage the compulsive overexercising, um, as well as not having emotional or practical support, having barriers um, such as distance or lack of providers, um, or not having adequate numbers of appointments available can be reasons to refer. So quite similar to anorexia. Okay, so outreach. Um, so when we talk about outreach specific to orthorexia, um, I want to jump to that last point first. Um, so we don't, we want to make sure on campus not to encourage dieting or to inadvertently support orthorexia. Um, so when I go across the country to campuses, um, working with you all, doing training, seeing the, the resources available, I'm quite impressed because most of, you, most of you are doing a fantastic job at not supporting one eating disorder over another. Um, and I think it's also important to spread that to the wellness um, programs on campus as well um, that are encouraging dieting or those kinds of things. Um, to be really careful in those encouragements to always encourage moderation of exercise of food rather than um, elimination. Um, be careful not to teach one eating disorder over another. Um, also, um, make sure that you're inviting students to ask for help. So have information on your website about orthorexia. Um, connect and collaborate with the recreation center um, or the wellness center on campus so that Students who may be overexercising, who may be looking at that website, are also aware of the resources available on campus. Don't have those magazines that I showed earlier in your office or reception area. Because once you've done the work, once you've put it out to the university and to the students that you're safe individuals to come to to work with orthorexia or other eating disorders, you don't want them seeing messages that are pro-orthorexia um, and causing them to turn around and walk out or no longer bring that subject up because it doesn't feel safe anymore. Um, you also want to make sure that you have recovery-friendly environments um, that are free from diet talk, fat talk, et cetera. Um, so this includes office staff. This includes office areas. Um, so make sure that there aren't signs up about the new wellness challenge that front desk staff and nurses and um, greeters aren't talking about their diet. Um, make sure that you're hosting outreach events that display your desire to support all students. Um, and I think you have to be creative in that. So I think that includes if you're developing brochures and flyers, um, if you have photos on your website, who is included in that? As we mentioned in the very beginning, um, 
minority individuals are less likely to seek support for individuals, but just as likely, um, or in some cases more likely, to struggle with them. So you want to make sure that you're inclusive and you're showing an inclusive message um, that everyone on campus um, is welcome to come in. I think also it can be important to reach out outside of your offices to multicultural centers, to LGBTQ resource centers, um, to, to give warm invitations to students who are more likely to struggle but are going to have more difficulty walking into your office. And so um, campus activities like Let's Talk, where you have a therapist available in the Multicultural Center or in the LGBTQ Center um, can be great ways of inviting these individuals into your centers um, and feeling supported along the way. I would also say as you're making additional referrals to dietitians, maybe to movement specialists or to medical providers, give warm handoffs as often as you can. Um, part of what this does is it makes it so much easier for individuals to get to that next person if you can help them with the appointment, if you can walk them down to the office to make the appointment, et cetera. Um, because what we don't want is them to get trapped and lost into the system. So I want you to think for a minute um, before we get to questions about what are you doing on your campus and, and what can you improve upon? Um, so to think about orthorexia specifically, um, what, what materials do you have on your website? What materials or trainings do your clinicians potentially need about orthorexia um, so that you're able to work with these students? How can you collaborate with the um, rec center on campus to make sure that you're um, referring students back and forth um, who may need more support. Um, so I think it's incredibly important to really think about what you're doing, what the gaps are, what the areas that you're needing help with, and certainly ask those questions because we're, those will be great opportunities and great things to talk about um, as we get into questions as well. Um, also, I would say in terms of invitations, make sure that you're taking advantage of, of um, different days to show students on campus that um, eating disorders are um, real, that they are concerning, and that you do care. Um, so you can certainly participate in Love Your Body Day on October 18th. Um, you can participate in Eating Disorders Awareness Week in February. Um, in Eating Recovery Day um, later in the spring. Um, and so, so reach out or ask us if you need ideas, but certainly make sure that you're letting students know that this is something that's really important um, for you on your campus. Okay, so let's get into some questions here. So what are the differentiators for OCD and orthorexia? It sounds like there's a lot of similarities. Absolutely. So there are a lot of similarities. Um, we certainly see that obsessive component with health. Um, we see that obsessive component and the, the following shame and guilt um, with um, needing you know certain food choices, and then if you uh, if you get off course, then we see that shame and guilt that follows. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. I would say um, with, with OCD, we don't always see it being debilitating in the same way where it continues to add and add and add like we see with orthorexia. So orthorexia continues to be progressive. So um, their diets become more and more restrictive. Um, so that can certainly be a difference. Um, also, if it shifts into an eating disorder, we see a difference where there is a drive for thinness um, that goes along with the behaviors. And so certainly if there's a drive for thinness, then we would be looking at anorexia rather than orthorexia. So, so it's, it's a great question and it's going to be interesting to see how researchers and how 
Um, the DSM continues to tease this out. So right now, um, if you see somebody with orthorexia, you have to kind of make that determination. Does it fit better under OCD um, with careful monitoring of the medical symptoms? Does it fit better under ARFID, which is certainly a similar diagnosis um, that has OCD, a lot of OCD factors associated with it, um, to kind of make that, that judgment call. Someone else asked, um, I wonder if you could speak to the complexities when orthorexia may be further complicated and encouraged due to GI issues such as IBS um, and ulcerative colitis or confirmed food intolerances, especially when eating foods viewed as bad, both from ED, GI diet recommendations. Would love to hear more. Yeah, it's a great question and certainly a complicating factor. Um, so we do see individuals with orthorexia who um, are trying, you know, when we see that obsession with health, who are trying to find the perfect diet um, to go along with their medical concern. Um, and so what we see, you know, when, when the orthorexia takes control is that the, restrict, the restriction is in excess of what, um, of what um, the recommended or encouraged diet may be. Um, so we see that taking, we see individuals taking that a step further. Um, confirmed food intolerances. So that's one of the things that we always question and double check to make sure that it is confirmed. So there are a lot of, um, what's the best way to word this? I would say non-confirmed, <laughs> um, confirmed food toler intolerances um, where someone may, um, um, you know, just be told by individuals who don't have the knowledge to truly determine food intolerances, where tests haven't been conducted, where it's, it's more so just been said to someone. Um, so I think it's careful to examine if those food intolerances or so-called confirmed food intolerances are in fact food intolerances um, or if they, um, you know, may have some self-selective components to those. Um, and I think your point to um, when eating food, foods viewed as bad from the ED um, or GI diet, um, I, I think certainly we see that, right? We see the shame and the guilt go along with that. Um, so I think it's an area where uh, I would say dietitians should, should certainly be involved and if you get someone in your office, you want to make sure that they have dietitians who are also informed about eating disorders, again, to make sure that they're um, knowledgeable about that fine line oftentimes between recommended diets for health versus um, eating disorder, um, restrictive um, eating, dis eating behaviors. So kind of a long-winded way to answer that question. If I didn't fully answer it and you have questions, further questions, feel free to email me. And certainly I would say I'm not a medical expert, so um, uh, some of our medical staff may have better answers for you um, who are more aware and more specific um, to the IBS and ulcerative colitis um, diets and food intolerances. Okay. So how do people with orthorexia respond to the label of normal food? Seems like a great important question, but wonder about the word normal. Yeah, so I think um, the word normal, I think, um, is just a word. I think um, it's, it's a, um, what we say, it, you know, there's no such thing really as a normal food, um, I think, but what we see is that um, there is, the need to have um, a diet that's rich in a variety of foods, uh, nutrients, um, and food groups. And so when we see the more restrictive diets, um, those don't contain the variety that are important um, to sustain life, to sustain um, body functioning, 
So, so I wouldn't use the word normal. I apologize if I did use the word normal, but I think um, when we see orthorexia, we're seeing this, this more obsession with health rather than um, having, uh, you know, a balanced um, intake of foods from a variety of food groups and, nutrition, and uh, nutritional content. Okay, so I feel like every orthorexia patient I've worked with struggles with trusting what the dietitian is advising despite their degree and training. Any advice on how to help patients like this get on board? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, because most of these individuals, like eating disorder individuals across the board, are incredibly intelligent. Um, they've done the work, right? They've done the research. They've researched every aspect about orthorexia, um, about healthy food. Um, they've read all those magazines that I've showed you. And so when you're talking as a dietitian, I think you have to be careful not to kind of go up against that, not to combat that you have more knowledge than they have, um, but just work with them um, from your expertise. And I think also um, uh, working with them on, you know, I think you in combination with the therapist working with them on those fears, on those underlying fears that um, come in with those food choices that if they eat, um, uh, you know, a, a fear food, if you will, um, then they're going to get cancer. So I think you have to really work on those fears and how that is impacting their life um, rather than just battling them knowledge to knowledge because they have a lot of knowledge. And I think it's similar to what we see with our patients with anorexia. Um, they have a lot of knowledge about anorexia most of the time. And so if we go in trying to educate them and trying to battle them, we're oftentimes going to lose that battle. Um, so I think, you know, focusing on those underlying factors, those fears, um, what this restrictive diet is taking from them. So if they're no longer able to eat with friends, they're no longer able to eat at a restaurant, they don't go to birthday parties, um, et cetera, um, those can be kind of your, your end point. And particularly utilizing values work can really help with that as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, certainly one of our diet dietitians um, could talk with you more about that. Um, I'm happy to connect to you um, if you have further questions um, or need for explanation there. Okay, a problem I've had with working with orthorexic clients is that they don't see themselves as having a problem. They just like eating healthy, and any attempt to help them see that they have a problem is met with great resistance and defiance. You're trying to kill me. You want me to get cancer. You want me to eat murder. Um, do you have any suggestions, Re, how to break through this and get them to see that they actually have a disorder? So I do think this is where value comes, comes um, uh, to the rescue, honestly. I think um, you have to really engage um, orthorexic clients in this discussion about what they're losing um, from the orthorexia, you know, what, what orthorexia is taking from their lives um, by examining their values. So I think with these individuals, um, you know, if they think, uh, you know, you're trying to kill them, or you want them to get cancer, you know, I think examining that, right? So, so you have a clue right there that um, if they diverge from this restrictive diet, then they're going to get cancer. And so that's part of the fear. And so I think connecting that to their values and then identifying how actually orthorexia can um, kill somebody based on malnutrition. Um, but I think, I think really tapping into values can be one of the biggest helps um, therapeutically in working with somebody with orthorexia because, again, um, this is so wrapped into both OCD behaviors and eating disorder beliefs where it's their method of coping with everything. So it's their method of coping with their fears. It's their method of coping with um, anxiety, 
depression, whatever, the, whatever, whatever exists, it's their way of coping with it. And so in order to get them to the point of allowing that anxiety um, to be there and to choose a different action, you have to involve values, work, and mindfulness. So I would help them with some mindfulness techniques, working on some guided imagery um, so that they can sit with those feelings um, and also work with them with values to identify how the eating disorder is going to take them away from their values or the orthorexia is going to take them away from their values rather than towards it. Does insurance tend to approve more intensive treatment for orthorexia? If a student is medically stable that simply cannot break their rigid patterns of eating. Yeah, so what we see is that um, it fits into ARFID oftentimes. Um, and so students um, are able to get um, more intensive treatment for behaviors. And I would say that's true for all eating disorders is that we oftentimes get, you know, we get more individuals into treatment um, and insurance paying for treatment based on behaviors rather than uh, medical stability. Um, so if you've listened to webinars, you've heard me say this before, that um, Dr. Mailer, Chief Medical Officer, says that you know, most individuals um, with eating disorders die with normal labs. Um, so if you're waiting for labs to be abnormal, then you're waiting too long. Uh, typically, the behaviors that are going to dictate that uh, treatment and referral. So yeah, absolutely. And it's most likely going to fit under avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, um, which closely mirrors and goes along with orthorexia. Okay, so what strategies have you found helpful to motivate a patient who needs a higher level of care when the patient is not motivated? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and so I covered that in a couple of the last um, webinar series as well. Um, I think this is the point in treatment where you shift um, to really utilizing motivational interviewing and values work. Um, so when you know they need a higher level of care and they're not motivated, I would really um, utilize motivational interviewing to get that change talk going. Um, so a simplistic example would be, um, you know, where are you on a scale of one to 10? in um, recognizing that you need a higher level of care, you need more support um, to, um, to recover, to be well. And, and so if they say, you know, I'm at a, a two, then you could say, how, how, do we get to, how do we move you from a two to a four? Well, what, what will it take for you to get to a four? Um, and so simple ways, motivational interviewing has tons of ways to begin to incorporate change talk. And so I would really, once you identify that someone needs a higher level of care, shift the work in session to um, motivational interviewing and values work. So it, in addition to the motivational interviewing, you can utilize values work to help them identify their values and how the eating disorder is taking them away from their values. So if you're not familiar with ACT and values work, there's some extraordinary uh, free resources available for ACT. Um, so if you go to the Happiness Trap website um, and find the link for professionals, then there are all kinds of free resources available. So you can read the first three chapters of many ACT books for free. Um, you can also find the Valued Living Questionnaire, which is included in the Happiness Trap book, um, as well as several other a compass to kind of build on the value living questionnaire. Um, and I actually really like the book, Act Made Simple. Um, so when I taught theories, I utilized Act Made Simple, and that has great resources um, that you can use directly with clients to help them connect with their values um, and utilize as a compass as they're moving forward. So, so motivational interviewing, Act. Um, is certainly what you want to switch to at this point. Okay, I have a client who struggles with OCD and is now having issues with ED um, issues. She keeps saying my ED is related to my OCD. 
She's lost 100 pounds in the past and is now at a healthy weight. She's been diagnosed with anorexia. What would be one way to distinguish orthorexia from anorexia? Um, so a clear way to, or, to distinguish orthorexia from anorexia is the drive for thinness. So if your patient um, wants to lose weight, um, then certainly that would be anorexia rather than orthorexia because orthorexia does not include the desire to lose weight. It's kind of the side effect. Um, so that's the key way to distinguish. Um, I think, you know, we, as I said earlier, we never see an eating disorder in isolation. So oftentimes we see eating disorders and OCD um, going hand in hand, so it's not uncommon that, that we would see this individual. Um, so I would say, you know, you, you kind of work from both um, aspects that uh, this individual does have anorexia as well as OCD um, unless there is zero desire for weight loss but I'm guessing with a hundred pound weight loss in the past there was some desire for that and in particular an anorexia diagnosis would require um, that drive for thinness so good question uh, we oftentimes see OCD and ED issues going hand in hand um, are there any screening tools for orthorexia other than the questions that you suggested? So if you look at the, um, the article, the Dunn and Bratman 2016 article, so it's D-U-N-N and Bratman, B-R-A-T-M-A-N 2016, um, along with their proposed criteria, um, they also have a screening tool that includes many of the questions that I um, included in the PowerPoint presentation. Stephen Bratman and some of his articles um, has also um, included uh, some previous questions to that, but, but the most relevant, most recent based on research is going to be in that Dunn and Bratman 2016 article. So if you need that, feel free to email me and I'm happy to send that to you as well. Um, but those are going to be the main screening tools for orthorexia. And, and what I like about having those, you know, those four simplistic questions is that we're asking a lot of questions at intake. We're asking a lot of questions on our forms. And so having just a few questions that are key to the central issues of, um, of orthorexia and other eating disorders like the SCOF um, are incredibly important. Um, to utilize. And, and when we talk about invitations, those are also inviting individuals to really um, bring up these issues and um, um, letting them know that it's important to you as well. Okay, so what, what is the recommended timing of doing ERP tasks in relation to the weight restoration process? Um, so, so most likely, you know, so it depends on where someone's at, but um, oftentimes um, the exposure and response uh, tasks are going to occur right away in that weight restoration process because they have to. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we, um, as we're weight, helping somebody weight restore, we have to incorporate uh, foods that are going to be fear foods for somebody with orthorexia. Um, so that's going to happen very early on. Um, in our program, we've worked with a handful of teenage college-age patients that are studying to become a dietitian. Any suggestions on how to work with these patients to balance what they are learning in school about healthy eating, calories, and food, and what we are teaching them in treatment about eating without guilt and enjoying foods? Um, and if they're in college in a dietetics program and are struggling, would you suggest any ideas on how the college could help given the triggering nature of their major? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess this is an area where I'll admit a bias as well. Um, I think that um, in the health fields in general, we see a higher prevalence of certainly orthorexia, um, which is documented by research, as well as um, eating disorders in general because of this um, focus on healthy eating calories and food. 
Um, and so I think there have to be strategies to both teach about um, the importance of, you know, variety in one's diet. Um, I would hope that dietitians are learning that restricting food um, groups is not healthy um, unless there is a significant medical reason to do so. Um, and so I would hope that they would be less likely to um, struggle with orthorexia than other individuals. I also think um, programs have a responsibility of talking about the risks that are associated. And I, I know when I was in med school, we talked about um, uh, freshman medical syndrome. And in psychology, we talked about freshman psychology syndrome. And that's kind of the, the phenomenon of, of self-diagnosing everything that you're learning <laughs> as you're kind of coming up with that. And, and as we all know, part of the reasons for that is that there's a level of quote-unquote normalcy to all disorders, right? Um, so I think, I think dietitians need a similar thing um, where we can kind of forecast that they may fall into these categories and, and have support into their programs as well. So I think um, programs should say, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about food um, in this program. And so that may be triggering for some of you um, who are predisposed to developing eating disorders. Um, and, you know, we will talk with you if we notice that. Um, and we have X, Y, and Z supports available for that. So I think it should be projected, you know, that this may come up. And here's what you do um, as a result of that. You know, I think about that in doing research when you have IRB approval, you know, you have to do that. You have to forecast what may come up for your participants as concerns, and you have to provide resources and responses um, to those individuals in advance of that becoming the case. So I think um, if I had a recommendation for dietetic programs, it would be that, you know, forecast with your students that um, being in a program where you're talking so much about food for those individuals who are predisposed to developing eating disorders, that could become an issue and that there are these supports um, in place for those individuals and that it's okay to bring that up and talk about that. Um, you know, I think hiding it certainly is ineffective. Um, so, so I think working with those individuals, focusing on the fact that we need all food groups, we need a variety of nutrients in our body, um, we need a balanced diet um, for optimal health would be the focus um, for those individuals. And I think dietitians are particularly adept at doing that. Um, so our dietitian, when I was at UNL, was great at giving this talk about how carbs um, go to these parts of your body, you know, carbs fuel your brain, uh, protein fuels, uh, this, you know, and so on. So I think talking about that um, with students, the importance of having a variety of food groups would be incredibly important. That's a, a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I have a client who's obsessed with eating perfectly. She has guilt when she consumes an unhealthy food, and if she consumes one, it often turns into a binge, no purge. Um, she desires some weight loss but does not have a drive for thinness. Is it possible to have a blended eating disorder? Um, absolutely it's possible. Um, I would say she has a desire for weight loss, um, and she is experiencing guilt when she eats unhealthy foods, and she's binging. Um, um, you know, I would certainly be looking for compensatory behaviors um, to see if there's overexercising going along with that, if there's um, restricting, if there are laxatives or diuretics um, to go along with that. But we, we do see blended eating disorders oftentimes. Um, so, so yes would be the answer. But I would, I would certainly look for 
compensatory behaviors to see um, if bulimia may be a good diagnosis for this individual. Um, certainly also um, we see individuals with binge eating disorder who have been on diet throughout their life. And so they have this obsession with dieting and with finding the perfect diet um, that is so connected with shame um, um, that, that this individual may struggle with binge eating disorder as well. Um, so I think you have to kind of tease out some of those factors um, and also get some more history from this individual um, to see kind of where they fit in more perfectly. Um, but it, it's very likely that they also have a, a blended um, eating disorder. Yeah, absolutely. So excellent questions. Thank you so much for um, making this uh, e-learning better by asking some fantastic questions that I'm sure many of you had. Um, make sure to stay logged on after the presentation ends. Um, to take your survey and provide feedback. And for those of you who wish to receive CE credits and who answer the CE questions, you should receive your CE certificate within 14 days. You'll also receive a link to um, the presentation as well as the PowerPoint slides um, within the next couple weeks as well. If additional questions come up, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at casey.talent at eatingrecovery.com. And also stay tuned. We will likely have one last um, Fall 2017 Eating Disorders on Campus webinar series presentation um, that will be announced soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, it will be addressing, um, it will be for medical providers and others talking about how to uh, begin the discussion about eating disorders with patients. So I think something that many of you will benefit from and have expressed interest in already. So thanks for participating. Have a great rest of the week.